Before the world, there was the Wargle, the giant rainbow serpent of the Noongar people. As it slithered across the land, it carved the rivers and waterways of Perth. Where it rested, it formed the Manjari, today known as Bather's Bay in the Port of Fremantle. Nearly all of the world's cultures speak of sea monsters, but before they lived in our imagination, they inhabited the oceans, and some of them are still there. In Pliny the Elder's Historia Naturalis, there is a fascinating account of an encounter with a real-life sea monster, which he calls the polypus, which means many-legged. Apparently, it used its numerous appendages to gorge itself on salted fish left near the shore. Eventually, the locals grew fed up and were drawn into battle with the beast, and this is only with the greatest difficulty that it could be dispatched with the aid of a considerable number of three-pronged fish spears. What's unique in this story is that the workers then present the body to their boss, Lucullus, who gives a detailed description of a 300 kilogram creature with 10 meter long tentacles and a head shaped like a wine amphora. This turns out to be an excellent description of the giant squid, bodies of which do occasionally wash to shore on beaches around the world. It took us until 2004 to get our first photographs of a living giant squid at a depth of 900 meters. It would be rare to see a living specimen in the shallow waters described by Pliny and even more unusual for it to come onto land and beat up some fishermen. So what we think actually happened is that the workers just happened to find a body washed ashore and then made up a story to get a bonus from their boss and some free drinks. We think that many stories of sea monsters may begin this way. This is Whaler's Tunnel, excavated to facilitate the transport of whale oil between Bather's Beach and the Port of Fremantle. Obviously, whales exist, although stories about mistaking them for islands and living inside their bellies are highly exaggerated. Sea serpents like the Norse Jorvingand and Hebrew Leviathan may be based on sightings of the giant oarfish. In 1996, we actually found a specimen of them accidentally washed ashore, and this team of US Navy SEALs managed to hold it up, looking very impressed with that catch. Theirs was seven meters long, pretty enormous, but not even close to the 17 meter limit. Their unique crest, long dorsal fin, and habits of swimming with their heads high above the water make them a likely candidate for the sea serpent legend. In 2011, we spotted a living, healthy specimen at a depth of 500 meters. We think that they only ever go to the surface when in great distress, which accounts for the infrequency of sightings despite being a pretty common species. It's by no accident that as we descend, we find larger and more monstrous sea creatures to live in the abyss that is basically mandatory. The deep sea has very limited resources, which counterintuitively gives larger individuals a competitive advantage. By evolving from something similar to a woodlouse into literally the stuff of nightmares, giant isopods are able to travel further in search of food, have improved energy efficiency, and can go for years in between meals. In April 2020, an Australian team of researchers found this giant siphonophore apollemia in the deep sea abyssal waters off of Ningaloo. We think it was spotted in a hunting configuration, looking like an alien UFO with a 15 meter diameter. It's all curled up, so making measurements was difficult, but we think that if it was unwound, it could stretch for 120 meters. That's the same distance as from here to the old Fremantle Hotel, 120 meters away. For context, that is four times longer than a blue whale, making the siphonophore the longest animal on earth. Although technically, it's not really a single animal, but instead thousands of genetically identical individuals, which work together to form the gelatinous colony. With such a diverse array of life, you may be wondering just how much is left to discover. By using something known as a collector's curve, we can make an educated guess. Collector's curves are often used in ecology, since they allow us to estimate the total number of different species living in a habitat without needing to count every single individual. You can imagine it like having a bag of different colored marbles and then drawing them out one after the other. At the beginning, we have a new color pretty much every time, but soon we start to get more and more repeats until our curve levels off and eventually becomes horizontal once we have found all of the different colors. What's great about this technique is that we don't need to empty the entire bag to work out how many colors there are. Instead, once the curve starts to level, we can just extrapolate forward. In order to create a collector's curve for sea monsters, we first need to define what a sea monster actually is. Unfortunately, there's no eldritch horror gene you can look for with a DNA swab, and subjective methods are also a bit flawed. I personally feel that dolphins are pretty cool and not at all monstrous, 
But the heraldic dolphins on old family crests suggest that our ancestors must have thought otherwise. However, I think that we can all agree that swimming with something significantly larger than yourself is pretty terrifying. So I'm going to be defining sea monster as anything two meters and above. By consulting scientific literature all the way back to Colonnaeus's Systema Natura, Oxford University researcher Charles Paxton was able to begin work on such a curve, plotting discoveries from 1829 to 1995. I've since built upon his work, incorporating some new data as well as fitting an improved function, giving us the most accurate collector's curve of sea monsters ever devised. As of the end of 2020, there were 223 large species of known marine creatures that we know in the oceans. And according to my curve, there are six remaining, somewhere undiscovered out there. As to what those six could be, well, we've got no idea. Although it does have to fit within our understanding of the Earth's oceans. Megalodon, the giant prehistoric shark, definitely doesn't exist anymore. Those were wide roaming, super apex predators that we would have spotted by now. Although the Meg was a pretty fun movie, we know that they can't be hiding out in deep sea canyons, since sharks aren't able to survive below 1500 meters due to some biochemical limitations. Based on recent discoveries, we expect that most of the missing species are going to be some forms of deep sea squid as well as toothed whales. However, there is room for a few wild cards. In 1976, we accidentally discovered the Megamouth shark, the sole surviving member of the Megachasmidae family. These alien looking species are about the size of a great white, but with a giant mouth used for scooping up krill. We actually found a specimen not too far from here, which today is being held in the WA Maritime Museum. Given the relative recency of its discovery, we expect that at least one or two of our missing sea monsters is going to be something equally unique. As we explore the world's oceans, we find that many of our sea monsters are based more on fact than on fiction. However, as we descend deeper, not even our legends can fully prepare us for what we might find. This has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up. Okay, we'll get breakfast. <laughs> okay, that was good. I think so.